Good evening. It is the 13th day of March 2021. <clears throat> and this video is going to be on um, military service and how military service can help an applicant for a law enforcement position. And specifically, I'm going to speak of federal law enforcement, but what I'm going to say also applies to state and local. But uh, because I'm most familiar with federal, and most of the videos that I've done so far pertain to federal law enforcement, that's where I'm going to uh, uh, address most of my remarks. Although, again, everything that I am saying uh, pertains to uh, state and local agencies as well. Uh, many people uh, believe that military service is um, uh, required for law enforcement or that the vast majority of law enforcement officers have military experience. And that is not true, either at the federal level or at the state or local level. Uh, what you will find is that the majority of those hired as special agents in the federal government or as police officers in the federal government or as state troopers or local police have not served in the military. So while military service is a plus, it is by no means a requirement. Now it's important to, um, because it's important I think to use your time wisely. You know, let's say you're 17, 18, 19, you know you wanna go into law enforcement. Of course, the absolute earliest you can apply is age 21. And realistically, you're looking at 23 or 24 for state and local before you will be hired, 23, 24 years of age, 28, 29 in the federal system. There are people who are hired earlier, but not often. So what do you do with your time? You know, do you go to school? Do you go in the military? Do you do both as I did? Um, do you do neither? Well, again, this video is going to talk about if you choose to go in the military and um, what branch of the service should you go in? You know, how should you serve? Well, that all depends. And it depends on the position that you are ultimately looking to obtain. Now, I'll tell you this, if you are looking to become a federal special agent, and that is an FBI special agent, a DEA special agent, an ICE special agent, Secret Service special agent, ATF special agent, probably a deputy marshal, okay, as well any of those agencies or any agency that is uh, requires what we call a GS 1811 criminal investigator uh, like it don't like it uh, those jobs all require a minimum of a bachelor's degree it is not possible to get hired without a bachelor's degree now do I think it's right no but it, what I think doesn't matter and my job is to help you and give you advice and I'm just telling you uh, if you don't get a bachelor's degree you're not going to get hired into one of those positions. It's very similar to the military. If you want a commission as an officer, uh, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, all branches of the military, we're speaking Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and their reserve components in the National Guard, there are different categories of personnel. There's commissioned officers who are at the high end of the pay grade scale. They lead and manage and um, they make more money, they have more responsibility, and generally speaking, they have at least a bachelor's degree prior to receiving a commission in the military. A commission is simply a warrant from the president uh, under the authority of the president that appoints a man or a woman to a position of uh, leadership or command in the armed forces, okay? The other way that you can serve in the military, now that the draft has been done away with for a long time, enlistment. You sign an enlisted enlistment contract. And enlisted men and women are at the bottom of the scale. So you could look at it, a, a rough analogy would be labor and management in a factory. But in law enforcement, especially state and local law enforcement, you're going to see the same thing. You have lieutenants and up on police departments. And then you have patrolmen and sergeants who are down at the bottom. And it, you know those are paramilitary organizations. In the federal agencies, you have uh, agents who are management supervisory, and then the vast majority who are non-supervisory. Now, the difference between law enforcement and the military is that everyone in law enforcement, at least theoretically, enters at the same level, which is entry level. And then those who go up to a high rank work their way up or do whatever it is to get promoted. 
Uh, in the military, there's different career paths. It's possible, but not usual, that a man or woman will go from enlisted to officer. Again, it's possible, uh, but without a college degree, it's almost never done, unless you're Audie Murphy, who was the most decorated soldier in World War II, or someone like that. Um, it's just very rare that you receive a battlefield commission. So do not enlist in the military planning without a degree, planning that, well, one day I'm, they're just gonna see how great I am and they'll commission me as an officer. That really isn't a plan, okay, I can tell you. That isn't a plan. Now, how do I know what I'm saying, what I'm speaking of? Well, number one, I was in the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration for 27 years, both in supervisory and regular uh, special agent position. I was a deputy sheriff. I was a commissioned officer in the Army Reserve. And I also served as an enlisted man in the U.S. Navy and in the U.S. Marine Corps. So one thing I wasn't in, I was never in the Air Force and I was never in the Coast Guard, but I know a lot of people who were. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, give you advice on how to how military service, should you choose to do it, how you can make it work for you uh, so that you can attain your goal of becoming a law enforcement officer. Or if you are in the military, how to apply your service the best way possible. Or if you're in the military right now, so that you can attain your goal of becoming a law enforcement officer. And again, the advice that I'm going to give depends on what position you are looking for. If you are going to apply for any position in the federal government ever, and that is a federal agent, if you're going to be a Capitol Police officer, if you're going to be a Border Patrol agent, if you're going to be Uniformed Secret Service, if you're going to work for the Department of Homeland Security as a Protective Service officer, uh, there is one thing that you want to make sure that you get if possible, and you, it may be possible, it may not. You want to be a preference eligible. Now, what is a preference eligible? Under federal law, veterans who are preference eligible must be hired, not can be, must be hired by law over non-preference eligibles. So that means if you are a veteran with an honorable discharge, and you qualify as a preference eligible, the agency by law has to take you over a non-preference eligible. That helped me a lot, okay? I would never have gotten hired by the DEA because of my brilliance or my huge amount of law enforcement experience. And the agencies probably don't want to do it a lot of times, but they have to do it. They can be taken into court if they don't do it. Now, how in the world do you become a preference eligible? there is one way to become a preference eligible. You are in the military, you have to serve on active duty, in a war, or in any kind of service for which an expeditionary medal or campaign badge is awarded. Now in my case, I was on a ship full of Marines that deployed off of Iran back in the hostage crisis, which was when Jimmy Carter was president. Everybody on that ship got the Expeditionary Medal, either the Marine Corps Expeditionary Medal, the Navy Expeditionary Medal. It doesn't matter which one you get, uh, but make sure you get it. If you get it, make sure it's on your DD-214, which is your separation form. They must give you a five-point preference. Now, if you have a Purple Heart, you know, which you probably don't want to get, but if you do get it, then you get a higher level of preference. But the five-point preference, an Expeditionary Medal or Campaign Badge. Now, who else qualifies for this? Well, again, if you've been deployed to, you know, let's say in the past 30 or 40 years, we'll look, you know, the Gulf War, you know, they get a campaign badge for sure, right? Bosnia got a campaign badge. Operation Iraqi Freedom and everyone who was in the military after September 11 up to the close of Iraqi Freedom got an arm, got a Global War on Terror Expeditionary Medal. That counts. Okay, if you have an Iraq campaign medal, that counts. Afghanistan medal, that counts. Um, now, how do you get these medals? Uh, what's the best way to get them? Well, you have to be in a unit that deploys. Okay, so if you're in the Marine Corps, you want to be in a fleet Marine Force unit. If you're in the Navy, you're aboard ship, the ships deploy. Okay, and they usually go to a, a trouble spot. And it's not something you really plan for, but you know, if you're fortunate enough to be deployed and not have to be in combat, then you get the medal. 
Back in the day, everyone who was in Vietnam got the Vietnam Campaign Service Medal. Uh, not that there would be too many applicants looking for it today to get a job because, you know, they're all 70 years old. But that medal went to even guys who were aboard ship off the coast of Vietnam, never set foot in Vietnam. But again, the law is what it is. I'm not saying it's fair. I'm just saying that's the law. And um, so a five-point preference, if you are a preference eligible, that means they must hire you over a non-preference eligible. Very important. It's the most important decoration you will get in the military if you're looking for a federal job. It puts you head and shoulders above, above everyone else. Secondly, uh, now this applies if you are looking to become a special agent in the DEA, FBI, uh, Naval Investigative Service, Secret Service, ATF, any of these agencies. Of course, you need a bachelor's degree. So the, the question, do you go to college? Do you go in the military? We, the, best is, the best answer is both. And what is my advice? If you can get an appointment to a service academy as a high school student, as an enlisted man in the military or woman in the military, um, get an appointment to West Point, Annapolis, or the Air Force Academy, uh, or the Merchant Marine Academy, because they will give you a college degree and a commission. Uh, now, if you cannot get an appointment, Maybe you're not going to a service academy. What other advice can I give you? Four letters, ROTC, okay? Uh, if you enroll at a college or university that has ROTC, uh, the most, I think the, the units that, uh, the service that has the most ROTC availability is the Army. And that's what I was in. I was an Army ROTC while I was a member of the reserves, okay? And if you are in the ROTC, and uh, then at, when you receive your degree, you will receive a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army or the Air Force or as an ensign in the Navy. Now, the uh, Army ROTC, again, I said that's the most common. Those are, they have more Army ROTC units than anything else. But if you want to go Navy or Air Force, that's fine. Uh, I would highly recommend that you do that if your college or university has that. And that would be a big point in choosing a college or university, whether they have ROTC. Uh, you can get a scholarship through ROTC, and that way you get your degree and a commission in the military. Now, why is a commission in the military important? Well, you want to get as much rank as you can get. Now, the reason you want to get as much rank as you can get is because you're trying to qualify for a certain pay grade level. In the FBI, it'll be GS-10. In the DEA, it'll be at least a GS-7 or GS-9, okay, and, and the other agencies, all right? An O-1, that is a second lieutenant in the, or an ensign in the armed forces, that's the lowest rank of commissioned officer, that is about the equivalent of a GS-7 in the federal service. Okay, a GS-12 in the Federal Service is about the equivalent of an O3, a captain or a lieutenant. Uh, and you can see the, the chart that I'm showing you and that will help you out a little bit. Um, so again, your responsibilities will be greater. Every officer that I've ever heard of, including myself, has been assigned to do audits, inspections, investigations, and you can write these up in your knowledge and strengths and abilities in your resume to get you the job, you know? So you don't have to do years of working in a, as an investigator on a police department. Now, of course, if you have a really high GPA, you're good too. Uh, but you gotta be sure that you, you put these things down on your resume and you report it correctly, okay? Um, so again, ROTC. Now the Marine Corps does not have ROTC. They get their ROT, a few from the Naval ROTC and ROTC program. Um, but uh, the Marines do have a program called the Platoon Leaders Class Program, which is they receive a stipend while they go to college and you go over the summer, two summers, I believe. And then at the end of that, you're commissioned in the Marine Corps. Now the difference between the PLC and ROTC is ROTC will give you a scholarship, the PLC will not. And the PLC, many are called, few are chosen. They do a lot of cutting at Quantico. The ROTC seems to be a little more, from my experience, user-friendly 
for sure. And, and your goal, remember your goal in mind is to become a commissioned officer. If you want to become an FBI, DEA, Customs, well, they don't have Customs, ICE, Secret Service, any of those, that's what you want to do, okay? The third thing that I think you're going to want to do, uh, if you're looking for, uh, again, a federal law enforcement position, the highest security clearance you can get. So if you can get a top secret clearance, you want that. And as a commissioned officer, you will have at least a secret security clearance. Okay. Well, what if you are finished with high school and you're enlisted now, and you're not planning on going to a, a military academy, you want to finish out your service? Um, okay, that works as well. Okay, it worked for me. Okay, what can you do? Well, number one, again, preference eligible. Okay, if you can deploy, deploy. Okay, uh, if you can get a campaign badge, an expeditionary medal, you want to get that. That's very, very useful. It's the most useful decoration you'll have. It's better than your achievement medal, anything like that. They don't care about that. They know about the expeditionary medal. That's what they look for on your DD-214. Secondly, um, again, try to get as much rank as you can. If you can, you should make NCO or petty officer rank in the enlisted ranks. Number three, if you can get a high security clearance, an intelligence job, okay? Uh, if you can go to DLI, the Defense Language Institute, as an enlisted man or woman, do that. Learn those languages. Learn a language, Farsi, Pashtun, Urdu, Arabic. This will help you immensely. Okay, um, and certainly there's the other uh, benefit, and that is called the GI Bill, the post 9-11 GI Bill, which pays for your college when you get out. So you want to take advantage of that. You need an honorable, fully honorable discharge. Get a fully honorable discharge and go to school. Okay, that's how you make your military service work for you. Okay, and that's what you want it to do. Okay, now, what are some things not to do, okay? Uh, if you're, well, I won't tell you what not to do, but I'll talk to a little bit about each branch of the service and their pros and cons from my perspective, okay? Again, when I went into law enforcement, DEA, there were a lot of former Marines in there. Now there isn't a lot of former anything in there. Uh, most, again, are not, have no military experience whatsoever. But let's say you're, you're planning on joining the Marines. Well, if you're going to go in as an officer, that's fine, okay? Uh, if you're going to go through the PLC program, the Officer Candidate program, you're going to Annapolis, NROTC, God bless you. If you're going to enlist in the Marine Corps, only do so under one condition, and that is you want to be a Marine. If you don't want to be a Marine, don't join the Marine Corps because there's no benefit to it, absolutely none, okay? The only benefit is you want to be a Marine, and remember, you're a Marine after your three months of boot camp. Uh, your boot camp's going to be hard, but it's not going to be, you know, it, it really isn't the Navy SEALs, okay? It's not the Army Rangers. Just about any normal person is going to make it through unless you quit. So don't quit, okay? Um, so you're going to make it through there, and you're going to become a Marine. But then remember also, um, your living conditions, uh, your facilities, um, your food, <laughs> um, just the level of supervision is going to be worth. It's going to be harder on you as an enlisted man in the Marines than in the other branches of the service, in my opinion. Uh, what you should not do under any circumstances is do what I did, which is enlist in the Marines on an open contract. Do not do that. I don't care what the recruiter tells you that you're going to be an Indian chief or a brain surgeon. They're, they sent me to infantry school and then I was a gate guard. Uh, at least get some choice as to what you're going to do. And it may not even be that. You might be a truck driver or a cook, you know, which if you want to do that, that's fine. But I would never want to do that. So I would never enlist in the Marine Corps on an open contract. Be sure that you're learning some sort of skill. The Army has the shortest terms of duty for enlisted I think you can go down to two years. That's great if you can get that. Um, they also tell you specifically what you're going to be doing. Now, the bad side of it is they will tell you, they'll try to push you into MOSs, jobs, 
military enlisted, enlistment jobs that they need filled, not necessarily that you're qualified for. But you should stick to what you're qualified for and what you want. So if you want to go to the Defense Language Institute, make sure you pass the D-Lab, the Defense Language Aptitude Battery, have a good ASVAB score, and then you want that high security clearance and, and learn those foreign languages. Okay. Uh, if you want to deploy frequently, you apply to the 82nd. They will give you a guarantee, I think, of the 82nd Airborne or the 101st Airborne. They deploy quite a bit. And if you go as a interpreter, that's even better. Okay. So you'll get a deployment ribbon plus a high security clearance, plus you'll speak a language that's off the wall, Arabic or Urdu or whatever the case may be. Okay, what you want to avoid is again being stuck as an ammunition bulk management specialist or some garbage like that. Again, that, that's probably not going to help you that much. The point of this, if you have a goal in mind, you work toward that goal. Okay, everybody in the military that makes a career out of it that I know of, all the generals, they work toward a goal. Yes, it is service, but it, it's not just one way, okay? Uh, make it work for you. That's my point, you know, because it's lemons. Enlisting in the military is lemons, but you want to turn it into lemonade. The Navy, okay? Um, I know several guys in DEA who were Navy nukes, enlisted men, who enlisted on the nuclear program and were on submarines and that is a great program to get into, okay? Uh, you'll have a high security clearance and you'll have a technical background. The advanced electronics program is a very good program to get into in the Navy. Uh, if you can get into Defense Language Institute, Cryptologic Technician, that is a good program to get into. Well, what about the Navy SEALs? Okay, here's the truth about the Navy SEALs. Many, many are called, very few are chosen. Do not count, unless you are an Olympic athlete, on making the Navy SEALs. They will let you into the training. They'll give you a, a contract that says you can try out for it, and you will get to try out for it. But that doesn't mean you're going to pass it. Okay, now I'm not trying to talk down to you. I'm not trying to discourage anybody. I'm just saying be realistic, okay? Uh, and, and maybe you are realistic. Maybe you think, you can, you know, if you can do 100 push-ups, without stopping and good push-ups and run three miles at six minute mile pace, hey, you, this may be for you, but most of us can't. Most of us can't. Most of the people in that, that program, if you have any question, they drop out of their own volition and others are asked, you know, they're removed from the program or asked to leave. Very few make it through the Navy SEALs, okay? Just keep that in mind. Now, if you make it, you've got it made, you know? with a college degree in Navy SEALs, you're going to be, you do very well. The same thing applies to the Army Special Forces and the Army Rangers as an enlisted man. If you go into either of those, remember, many are called, few are chosen. Um, what about the Air Force? I don't know a lot about the Air Force. I was never in the Air Force. Everyone I know that was in the Air Force is happy with it. So if you want to go in the Air Force, go in the Air Force. But again, try to become a preference eligible. Try to get a high security clearance. Try to get a high tech job. You know, the Coast Guard. Um, it's you know, uh, it, it it'll certainly help you. Certainly as an officer, uh, enlisted service in the Coast Guard, you're probably not going to deploy as much to where you would get a campaign badge or ribbon. Uh, but they do do law enforcement work. So. Um, you know, they all have their benefits. They're all, all of them have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so hopefully that, that's been somewhat useful. I mean, it's clearer than mud. Now, if you're going state and local, okay, as long as you have an honorable discharge and military service, most municipalities and states will give you veterans preference, unlike the federal government. Again, the federal government, you have to have that campaign badge or ribbon. State and local, they'll usually give you veterans preference. In certain departments, such as the NYPD, the California Highway Patrol, they actively recruit military veterans. Okay, on their webpage, you'll see that they're looking for military veterans. Okay, what about non-huge municipalities or states? Well, my sheriff's department that I was on, the, the sheriff was a former Marine drill instructor, so he took former Marines. Uh, so there you go. 
so it, it depends. You have to check with the agency to see if you get veterans preference or not. But uh, all of the military service will help you. Now, if I was a police recruiter, I'm looking for police recruits. If I had a guy who had four years active military service and another applicant who had four years of criminal justice, I'd look at that enlisted military service and if he came out as an NCO or petty officer, I would probably take him or her over the guy who had four years of college and no experience. Now, why is that? Because I know who knows life better. I know who has more common sense experience with the world. And I know who's worked harder has been the military veteran. So if I was a police recruiter, whether it's a suburban police department, a county, rural county, a big city, I know who I would take. Now, obviously the best is both. Why have one or the other? Why not go to college and have military service? And especially when your enlisted service is over, if they pay for it, hey, if they're going to pay for something, take it, you know? And they pay you as an E5 while you are under the current GI Bill, the post 9-11 GI Bill, I would take that, okay? Whatever you do, if you join the military, do not leave before your enlistment is over with a less than fully honorable discharge, okay? Come hell or high water, you want a fully honorable discharge, okay? And uh, make the best of your military service. And uh, if, if you don't think that you can stick it out, don't join, you know, don't join at all. So hopefully this has been helpful to you. And um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Okay, thank you and God bless.